Everyone who took pictures used cameras with film. <laughs> and when you took these pictures, once you were done taking them, you had to take them to be developed at like a store that would develop them. And you had to wait for the pictures. And you had to pay for the pictures once they came back. And every once in a while, when you got your pictures back, you couldn't see them immediately. Oh, what did I take? Um, you would have a couple of pictures that would be double exposed. Any of you remember this? So you, you would have like two images laying over one another. And they would, they would create for some really otherworldly images. Now it's really interesting in the art world, this can actually be a purposeful technique to double expose pictures so that you can make, take these two striking realities and lay them over one another for an effect. So I've got just a couple of pictures, just a couple of examples. This would be an example of a double exposed picture. So that'd be another one, kind of a cool... So I just wanted to give you, give you this, this, this visual of, of something that is you have, where you have one image and then you have another image laid over one another. And I've been thinking a lot this, this Christmas season about this idea of kind of mapping two realities over one another. Because I think in the Bible, we get this sort of dramatic double exposure several times in the Bible, where you have two realities that are overlaid. One reality would be what we commonly understand, the, the physical, earthly reality that we're used to seeing. And the other reality would be what we might call the spiritual, heavenly reality. That which is typically unseen by human eyes. But every once in a while, God allows this spiritual, heavenly reality to be seen. And there, there becomes what, at least to our understanding, would feel like this double exposure of heaven and earth mapped over one another. We see this actually several times in the Christmas narrative in texts like we find in Luke chapter 2. I'll read this very classic uh, narrative right out of Luke chapter 2 starting at verse 8. It says, and there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Messiah the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to, said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what, had been to what they had been told about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. So in this narrative, we, we have the unseen realm 
momentarily allowing itself to be seen. So that normally unseen heavenly beings could proclaim the birth of the one who left the glory of heaven to become human. In so doing, we could say that Jesus himself actually becomes the ultimate double exposure of heaven meets earth. Son of God and son of man, the one who is fully God, but also born fully human. There are times that Jesus walked the earth that, that this reality, this dual reality, we might say, became almost uncomfortably clear. One time um, that was like that we have recorded in the Gospels, we call the transfiguration. And in this moment, this unveiling of Jesus' glory, we, we're told in the Gospels that his face shone like the sun and his clothes became as white as light as bright as a flash of lightning. And it was accompanied by a bright enveloping cloud. Matthew tells us that this, this unveiling of this otherworldly glory of Jesus, that Peter, James, and John fell face down to the ground, terrified. Thus the apostle John could later say, with full conviction in the prologue of his gospel, the word that is Jesus, became flesh and made his dwelling. And that, that, that word in the Greek means that he pitched his tent, he tabernacled, he made his tabernacle among us. And then John says, we have seen his glory, that, that otherworldly glory of God. He says, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. But what should lead us to an even greater wonder is how Jesus, this man of heaven, chooses to live into his earthly reality. This eternal one celebrated and worshipped by myriads of angels enters humanity in the humblest way possible. He's born into a working class poor family. His birth happens when he's displaced by an occupying nation that calls for a census. His mother Mary has to give birth in a space that's typically reserved for livestock. And she makes a feeding trough his temporary crib. The great author C.S. Lewis described this mystery by saying, once in our world... A stable had something in it that was bigger than our whole world. Jill Phillips, in the song Labor of Love, sings of this paradox, saying that this very baby was the maker of the moon. He was the author of the faith that could make the mountains move. So what should we make of this seeming paradox? of this double exposure, if you will, of heaven overlapping earth and how the heavenly Son of God chose to share our earthly reality. For one, we see in Jesus that he invited us to realize that there is indeed a glorious reality that is just as real, perhaps even more real, than the reality that we presently see. Our secularized culture tends to scoff at this idea of a spiritual realm. We tend to think that it is only what we see and only what we can measure that can be defined as real. But the Bible presents us with a very different narrative. It invites us to believe that what we see is actually only a small fraction of what is really real. That it's only a small fraction of a far greater reality. It tells us that a supreme God of spirit created all that we see, with humanity being the pinnacle of that creation. 
And that humanity and this God of spirit once walked together in perfect harmony and love in a place called Eden or delight where the reality of heaven perfectly overlapped the reality of earth. That is until humanity chose autonomy in rebellion against our creator. But as Jesus becomes flesh, we see that God reaches out to us in love, longing to rescue us from our own self-destruction. So the Bible gives us a great hope that there's profoundly more going on than meets our physical eye within this broken world. And when the glorious God the Son entered our physical reality, we see that he did so by purposely choosing to associate himself with the lowly, with the poor, with the marginalized, with what we would call the least of these. Where we tend to gravitate toward people that we believe might be advantageous to us, Jesus came to the least advantaged. The majestic, transcendent God of heaven was willing to relate to humanity in all of our frailty, in all of our weakness, in all of our pain. This man of heaven refused all the privileges of his divinity, choosing instead to fully embrace our earthly reality, including all the painful consequences of our rebellion, of our evil, even of our evil against the very God that he is. He did this all the way through his own torturous death, his unjust death, absorbing into himself all the evil of humanity, becoming himself a holy, atoning sacrifice before God the Father as he accept, accepted the consequences of all of our wrongdoing. Such love is meant both to rescue us by reconciling us back to the Creator God through faith in His substitutionary sacrifice and to rescue us by showing us a different way, a different way to perceive, a different way to value, a different way to relate to one another that those who would follow Jesus would begin to relate to one another, to perceive, to value in the same way that the man of heaven perceived and valued and related to us. That he came in humility and sacrificial love. That he met us in our weakest place. He met us in our lowliness. He met us in our brokenness. But this Jesus, himself being the perfect, eternal author of life, could not be held by death. Death could not have the final word for him. And so through his resurrection unto immortality, he, he takes on a new, eternal, immortal spirit body. And in, again, in this spirit body, we're confronted with a sort of double exposure of heaven meeting earth. But the joy of Jesus' resurrection is that this resurrection is not meant only for him, but that it's just the first of many. That it would extend to all who would believe in him, to all who would repent and trust that he has paid for their sins, to all that would call him Savior and follow him as Lord. And for all those who would do so, death also would not be the final word for them. And that through faith, our very lives, even now, would become a double exposure of heaven and earth, now in spirit, and one day fully in both body and spirit upon Jesus' second coming, his second advent. And so as we ponder this baby in a manger, I would invite you tonight to see more than would meet the physical eye. That in him, we see heaven meeting earth. 
in the most unexpected way possible. And may we see that what he accomplished as a man has welcomed us into a new sort of Eden. That God and mankind could once again, through Jesus, walk in love together, walk in harmony together, walk in peace together, and that we would begin to do that in Christ with one another. That our very lives in our Christian communities could be this double exposure, a place where heaven and earth collide because of the God-man, Jesus Christ. Amen? I'm going to close my time here by reading the lyrics of a song called Manger Throne. What kind of king would leave his throne in heaven to make earth his home? While men seek fame and great renown, in loneliness our king comes down. Jesus, Jesus, precious one, how we thank you that you've come. Jesus, Jesus, precious one, a manger throne for God's own son. You left the sound of angels' praise to come for men with unkind ways. And by this baby's helplessness, the power of nations is laid to rest. Jesus, Jesus, precious one, how we thank you that you've come. Jesus, Jesus, precious one, a manger throne for God's own son. What kind of king would come so small, from glory to a humble stall? That dirty manger is my heart too. I'll make it a royal throne for you. My heart is a throne. My heart is a throne for God's own son. Jesus, Jesus, precious one, how we thank you that you've come. Jesus, Jesus, precious one, a manger throne for God's own son.